Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. It's good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. And to you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping during the hour coming up we can be a real inspiration. So if you'll call a friend and have them to tune in, then they too can be blessed in this hour coming up. If you have your Bible, you turn to Luke chapter 10. It's page 1088 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. You out in the radio listening audience, if you're not getting our daily broadcast, if you're tuned to the station where you're now listening, you can get the broadcast at 12 o'clock noon each day. I hope you tune in and get us Monday through Saturday. Now the singing and the message today will be on cassette tape. We send these tape out for a gift of $3 of each tape, and the gift is used to help defray the radio expense. Now I'm speaking today on this subject. What is mine is mine. What is thine is mine. What is mine is thine. I'll explain that to you when I get into the message. And the tape will be tape number 173. Tape number 173. We have 170 tapes listed. Be glad to send you a copy of the list of tape we have, 170 listed. And you can select some maybe you'd like to have to play in your home or care to uh, convalescent homes or prison or whatnot. See the letter last week from a lady over in South Carolina. Uh, they received one of our tape and, and she let her uncle have it and he's a guard at a maximum security prison. He carried that tape to the prison. Many inmates heard it and still listening to it. I hope it will do much good. So you write in and get the tape. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. We covet your prayers. We want you to write to us. Now, if you have your Bible and your New Testament handy, I hope you found Luke chapter 10. Someone was telling me the other day about a man that spoke up when he should have been listening you have to be careful sometimes what you say. You don't know who's around you, who's behind you. This man went to the hardware store, and one of the, uh, the dealers there, one of the salesmen, rather, met him on the outside. He told him, said, I want to buy a half a joint of stovepipe. The salesman said, well, we don't uh, sell it by half a joint. So we'll sell you a whole joint. He said, I want a half a joint of stovepipe. He said, well, I'll go in and speak to the manager and see what he has to say about it. He didn't know this fellow followed him on the inside. He went in and walked up to the manager. He said, listen, said there's a nut, a goofy fellow out here on the outside wanting a half a joint of stovepipe. And then he turned and saw the man standing behind him. He said, now this gentleman behind us, this nice, handsome gentleman behind us wants the other half. And so you have to kind of be careful what you say. You're liable to speak up when you ought to be listening. Of course, I guess there's always a way to get out of something. Now, Luke chapter 10, beginning with verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbors thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and fell among thieves, which stripped him his raiment and wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. By chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, poured in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pits and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou 
likewise. Now to justify my subject, if you notice here, a man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and everything he had belonged to him. He said, what is mine is mine. Some thieves came along and said, uh, what is thine is mine. So they took it. The good Samaritan came along and said, what is mine is thine. So he gave him some uh, aid there and helped him. And so that should justify my subject. And I want to speak uh, on this scripture today. Uh, some uh, two or three weeks ago, while in the Holy Land, we traveled down this Jericho road some two or three times. And each time we saw the little inn beside the road where they carried this man that had been beaten up and robbed by the thieves. We've stopped at that inn many times and taken pictures, but we didn't stop this time. We did see the inn on the Jericho road down from Jerusalem to Jericho. But I want to expatiate upon these verses today and see if we can't find some thoughts here will help us and feed our hearts and souls and warn you that know not the Lord. Now notice to whom this man was spoken. Uh, uh, the Bible tells us here, rather, the sermon was spoken to. He was a doctor of the law of the Old Testament, a lawyer. A doctor of the law of the Old Testament. He came to the Lord Jesus Christ asking him what he should do to inherit eternal life. And uh, Jesus told him what to do. He said, this do and thou shalt live, verse 28. Now, he wouldn't live by keeping the law, but the law is our schoolmaster to lead us to Jesus. If a man will follow the schoolmaster, he'll come to the Lord for salvation. And now these people would not claim a Samaritan as a neighbor. That is the Jewish people in those days. They did not like the Samaritans. They had nothing to do with them because they were half breed, half Assyrian and half a uh, Jew and that have nothing to do with them. And so we find the good Samaritan doing something here that's very commendable because he did something to help this beaten up Jew that had gone down from Jerusalem to Jericho and had been robbed and beaten up by these thieves. Now the Bible said a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now every name in the Bible, every proper name has an outstanding meaning. The name Bethlehem means house of bread. The name Elijah means strength of God. The name Hebron means fellowship. The name Isaac means laughter. The name Isaiah means God is salvation. The name Jerusalem means the city of God. If you ever notice the name Jerusalem where it's spelled? Right in the center of the name Jerusalem you have USA. J-E-R-U-S-A-L-E-M. USA right in the middle of Jerusalem. So even now the United States is right in the middle of Israel over there. Helping to prop them up and keep them uh, surviving and carrying on in a great way. And then Malachi means my messenger. The name Salem means peace. The name Seth means in place of. The name Terah means delay. And on and on you go. Checking these names in the Bible. Most all great proper names have an outstanding meaning. Now this man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. Now with Jericho, the Dead Sea is the lowest part on the earth on this planet. That is, it's 1,300 feet below sea level. The lowest part on the face of the earth. And to go down to Jericho, you'd go down grade all the way from Jerusalem. Jerusalem's on a hill down to the city of Jericho and the Dead Sea. Now this man took a journey from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jerusalem meaning possession of peace, Jericho meaning a curse. And he was traveling down this road on a downward move, going down to Jericho. Now you can look at this parable here from a dispensational viewpoint. You can deal with it also from a pragmatic viewpoint, a viewpoint rather, and you can deal with it also from a prophetic viewpoint. I want to touch on all three today, the time permitting. Now he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and to deal with it from a dispensational viewpoint, you'd go all the way back to Adam. This man here is a type of Adam that went down from a possession of peace and fell under a curse. Now when he did, he led the entire human race under a curse. That's exactly what happened in the Garden of Eden. That's what happened when Adam and Eve were expelled from the Garden. They were placed under a curse and from that time until now, the entire human race has been under a curse. And the devil is a god of this world system. So he went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among thieves. Now that's exactly what Adam did in the Garden of Eden. He fell among thieves. He fell among the devil and all of his imps. And he was stripped and robbed and wounded in the Garden. Adam in the Garden lost his righteous standing before God. 
He lost his kind of glory of God that covered his nakedness. And there he was wounded by the God of this world system. Now that's what happened to the human race when it went down in Adam. This man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, a possession of peace, and fell under curse. The Bible said he was robbed. These thieves saw the man traveling down the Jericho road, and they robbed him. They beat him up. They cast him aside. They took everything he had and left the man. That's what the devil did to the human race in the Garden of Eden. He robbed the human race of all of its righteous standing before God and left it naked before God and expelled from the beautiful garden. Then the Bible said a certain priest came that way. Now this priest saw the man had already been robbed and he most certainly had no need for him because there's nothing he could get there. And he went on down the road. The next man comes along is a Levite. And so he's typical of the law. And he saw the man had nothing and could do nothing to gain righteousness. So he goes on down the road. Now that's exactly what happened to the human race when Adam fell in the garden from uh, Jerusalem toward Jericho, as it were. He was stripped and left wounded and naked and half dead and bruised and beaten. And so we find then that religion came along. All kind of religion with its ceremonies and deeds and so forth. And when religion came to the earth, religion could not lift man back to God. I don't care how much religion you may have, how many churches you may join. You may be joined every church you possibly could join and be baptized so many times until the tadpoles would recognize your uh, serial number and still die and go to hell. Beloved, religion will not get you to God. There's only one time in the Bible that religion is spoken well of, and that's in the book of James, where it's doing good to widows and offerings. Religion will not save anyone. The devil is a very religious person, and the devil is working today in the religious realm. That's why he's working. He's not worried about the juke joints and the beer dives and things of that type and the cusses and the gamblers. He's already got that crowd. They're led astray by the lust of the flesh. You're out here uh, serving the flesh and the world and the devil. He's not concerned about that crowd. The devil is concerned about the religious crowd. People getting religion. He wants everybody to get some kind of religion. And there's never been a time when there's so many cults and so much religion in the world as you'll find now. They tell me in Los Angeles, California, it takes three yellow pages to list only the cults in that city, just the cults. And they're springing up every day. Almost anybody can go along and claim he's talked to God or claim some angel came to him and start talking about religion. He can get some followers. They'll Lord join up with him. They'll follow him. He can get some followers and start him a cult, start him a movement. That's why you have so many cults in the land today. Human beings, demonized, led by the devil, go out and get people to follow them in their cult. That's why you need to understand the Word of God. So we see religion came along. Religion can't lift man to God. And then God gave the law. The Levite represents the law. And law can't save man. Now you can keep the Ten Commandments and go straight to hell as a martin to his good. Beloved, you cannot go to heaven by keeping the law. The Bible plainly tells you that if man could have been saved by keeping the law, there'd been no need of Jesus coming and paying the sin debt. So the Levite went by on the other side. And so this man fell among these thieves, wounded him, left him half dead and departed and left him there in the road, in the gutter. That's exactly the way the devil will do you. He'll get you in trouble and then he'll laugh at you and leave you. Now this man was left half dead and that's a picture of the human race today. The human race is half dead. It is spiritually dead and physically dying. That's a picture of the human race today. Spiritually dead, physically dying. He's alive, man would. The human race is alive, world would, alive, sin would, but dead, God would. Now you must keep that in mind. Every lost sinner today is dead in trespasses, dead in sins. And you must keep that in mind. I don't care how religious you are, you're dead in trespasses. You're dead in sins. Hell will be your destination if you die without God. But I'm glad that someone else came along. In verse 33, if you notice he said, a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. Now you must remember that the Jews had no dealings with the Samaritans. Read John 4, I'll tell you so. And this was a wounded Jew. He had been beaten up and robbed and left there half dead. And this Samaritan came along. 
Now the Jewish Levite, the Jewish priest wouldn't help the man. Although he was a Jew, they just went on by and left him. And he was there bleeding and the good Samaritan came along. Now the good Samaritan here is none other than Jesus Christ. He pictures himself as a good Samaritan. He calls himself that. Now he journeyed. The Bible says he journeyed. Now this good Samaritan journeyed down the highway. He finds this man. That's exactly what Jesus did. Jesus journeyed. One day God the Father said to the Son, I want you to take a journey. I want you to journey down to the earth. I want you to walk up on the shores of Galilee. I want you to perform miracles. I want you to suffer. I want you to meet. I want you to die and then come back home. That's exactly what the good Samaritan did. Jesus, our Savior, came down to this earth. He journeyed to verse 33. In verse 33, he came where he was. Jesus said in John 6, 38, he came down from heaven. So Jesus, our good Samaritan, came down to us. He came to the earth planet, down to us. In verse 33, he used his eyes. He saw the man. He saw his sad condition. The same thing today Jesus does. He sees our condition. He knows all about us. He sees every move we make. And so he saw the man's condition. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 15 and verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, beholding the evil and the good. So God sees you today, sees me, sees everyone. Nothing escapes the eyes of God. And then we find in the next step he had compassion on him. That is from his heart. He had compassion upon this fallen man. The Bible said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus said in John chapter 15, verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And so we see the great compassionate heart of God toward the human race. Had not God had compassion on us, we'd all go to hell. Had not God had compassion on us, we wouldn't be here today enjoying the blessings of God. God had compassion on us. The Bible also tells us in verse 34 that he went to him. Now the good Samaritan went to the fallen man, saw him in the gutter, saw him in the dust and dirt, saw him bleeding, saw him dying, and he went to him. One day when I was a dead state, spiritually speaking, when I was without God, when I was a wicked sinner, Jesus came to me. Jesus came into my heart. One day, whenever you realize your lost condition and you repent of your sins, Jesus came to you. And he came into your heart in the person of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says Christ in you is hope of glory. In verse 34, he used his feet, he went to him. And in verse 34, he used his hands, he bound up his wounds. This good Samaritan got down with this man, used his hands, bound up his wounds, trying to help the poor man. The good Samaritan. That's exactly what Jesus did for you when he came into your heart. Now Isaiah gives us a picture of your state before God, before Jesus bound up your wounds. The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 6, From the sole of the foot even to the head, there's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores, they have not been clothed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. That's your picture without God today. And only God can reach down and bound up your wounds and help you and take care of you. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me and he came where we were, bound up by what used his hands. And in verse 34, the Bible said he poured in oil and wine. The good Samaritan poured in oil and poured in wine. Now, oil in the Bible is a type of the Holy Spirit. The Bible plainly tells you without the Spirit of Christ, you're none of his. And he comes into your heart and bosom the moment you're saved. He poured in oil. Oil being a type of the Spirit of God, He poured in the oil. And that's what God did for you the moment you were saved. He put the Spirit of God in you. Since that time, He anoints you and helps you with the Spirit of God that lives inside of you. So He poured in oil and wine. Wine in the Bible is symbolic of joy. When you read about wine in the Bible, you read about joy many times. It's not talking about the kind of wine that will make you drunk, of course. It's talking about pure grape juice. In Psalms chapter 105 and verse 15, And wine that maketh glad the heart of man, and oil that make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. 
So he tells you here, oil makes your face shine to the glory of God, and the wine puts real joy in your heart. Now we need to realize that the more we feel with God's Spirit, the better countenance we'll have toward the outward world. There's a man one time told some fellows, said, you know, I've been fasting a long period of time and said, my face shines just like Moses' face did when he came down from uh, Mount uh, Sinai. But the only problem was he's the only one that knew it. Those that looked at him couldn't tell any difference. In Judges chapter 9 and verse 13, and the vine said to them, should I leave my wine which cherish God and man? And so people that are filled with God's wine, I'm talking about the Spirit of God and filled with God's Spirit like the world of the day of Pentecost. In Acts chapter 2 and verse 13, they said, These men are full of new wine. They were. They were filled with the wine of God's Spirit. And they were happy. And they were rejoicing. Now, when you get filled with God's Spirit, you have something to be happy about. Now, you have a lot of church members that mope around with a long face and look like they could drink milk from the bottom of a churn. Well, beloved, they don't have the Spirit of God like they ought to have overflowing in their hearts. God wants us to be thrilled and blessed and happy in serving the Lord. God wants us to do so. And we can do so. We can be happy. We can be joyful if we let the Spirit of God completely take over. One of our dear uh, visitors here this morning raised his hand uh, doing the um, uh, singing, I believe, during the Sunday school hour. His little boy raised his. See, many times what we do, our children do. And if we get happy and praise the Lord, then it's contagious. Sometimes they do likewise. Now, God wants us to be happy and praise the Lord. These men are full of new wine. Romans chapter 8 and verse 9, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. If you don't have the new wine in your heart, which is the Holy Spirit, you don't belong to God. And so the good Samaritan not only bound up the man's wounds, but he poured in wine and oil gave the man wine to drink and poured in the oil in the bruised places that's what he did for fallen man that's exactly what god did for you when you got saved god put the oil in you and gave the wine to drink that you might enjoy the blessings of god over and over again in the bible it speaks about being filled with the holy ghost and with joy and then in verse 38 we find the good samaritan did something unusual he set him on his own beast, verse 34. That's just like the Lord Jesus. He set the man on his own beast. The good Samaritan said, you ride and I will walk. He came down that we might go up. He died that we might live. He walked on the earth that we could walk in heaven someday. See, Jesus came down so we can go up. He died so we can live. He walked on the earth so we can walk in heaven. Now you keep that in mind. He said, you ride my donkey and I'll walk. And the good Samaritan helped this man on his donkey. And he didn't leave him there. He brought him to an inn. The Bible says in verse 34, if you notice that, he brought him to an inn. Now an inn in the Bible is a place of safekeeping. The inn in the Bible is a type of the church. The innkeeper here is a type of the Holy Spirit. Now when God saves you, he puts you in the body of Christ. He puts you in the invisible body of Christ and then you become part of the local assembly when you unite with God's people. You become part of the local assembly, the visible assembly of God. So when you get saved, the moment you're saved, you're placed into the body of Christ and as quickly as possible, you need to line up with a good Bible-believing church and serve the Lord. He brought him to an end. He brought him to a place of safekeeping. The safest place for any Christian as he serves God is in the local church. There you have people to fellowship with. You have people to pray for you. You have people to guide you and help you. You have a pastor to preach to you and teach you the word of God and to pray for you and to help you. And we need each other. That's why God established a local church. We might have each other. That we might get together to pool our resources. We might get the gospel out by missionaries and, and radio and and orphanage homes and camps and where we can like we're doing here at Northside. That's why that God wants us to have a local assembly. He wants you to have an under shepherd that he might lead you and help you and teach you and protect you from the wolves that might come your way. And so he put him in the inn and the Bible said he took care of him. I'm glad when God saves a man 
They didn't just turn him loose to let him run free or run wherever he wants to go. But the Spirit of God indwells him and watches over him and protects him and guides him step by step. He said to the innkeeper, take care of him. He meant for the innkeeper to take care of the man, take care of him, verse 34. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. He didn't say all your wants, he said all your needs. And so when God saves you, God is obligated to take care of your needs according to his will. In Psalms chapter 37, verse 25, I've been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. David said, I'm an old man. I was young, now I'm an old man. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God will take care of his arm. Now I want you to notice the prophetic viewpoint of this parable. I've given you um, the dispensational right up to the coming of the Lord. I've given you the pragmatic phase of it, what happened on the Jericho road. Now let's look at the, the prophetic phase of this parable. In verse 35, the Bible tells us here that he promised to come again. The good Samaritan is coming again one of these days. He's promised to come again. And then we find in verse 35, he said, if there's anything extra, lay that on my account, charge that to me. The good Samaritan said to the innkeeper, charge everything to me. If anything extra, charge that to me. In 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible said, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, he is our lawyer. He is our advocate at the right hand of God the Father. And every time the devil accuses one of God's children uh, to, the, to God, uh, God said, uh, Jesus at the right hand of the Father said, lay that to my account. Charge that to me. I paid the sin there. When Jesus died on Calvary, he paid all of our past, all of our present, and all of our future sins. Jesus paid for all sins from the beginning to the end. And every child of God, when he's accused by the devil, then all he has to do is go to God in prayer. Jesus said, charge that to me. And if we confess our sins, he's faithful just forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said, if there's anything extra, I'll take care of that. And Jesus Christ paid for all of your sins, your past, your present, and your future sins. All of it is charged to Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, Wherefore is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God, by him seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus ever liveth at the right hand of God the Father to make intercession for God's people upon the earth. In the book of Philemon, verse 18, Paul speaking there about Onesimus. He said, if he's wrong, thee owe thee anything, or ought put that to my account. Paul said, charge it to me. Don't hold it against him. And Jesus today says, charge everything to me. All of my children, from, their, from the past, the future, present, the future, charge everything to me. I paid for that on the cross. And so today, beloved, when the devil disturbs you, just get on your knees, talk to your father, confess your sins and mistakes, and all that is charged to Jesus. And you won't have to pay for that at the judgment seat of Christ. The good Samaritan says, charge everything to me. When I come again, I'll take care of all at expense. And one of these days, that good Samaritan is coming back again. That Samaritan is the Lord Jesus Christ. When this man started from Jerusalem, he said, what's mine is mine. The thieves came on the scene and said, what's um, thine is mine. And they took it. The good Samaritan came along and said, what I have, what's mine is thine. And they gave it to him. So that was my subject for today. What's mine is mine. What's thine is mine. What's mine is thine. The tape is number 173. It's available. You and the radio listen artists write in and get the tape. I appreciate you listening today. God bless you. You've listened well. I appreciate you and the radio listen artists. Let us all stand to our feet. Our Father, I pray today that you'll take the message and use it to thy glory. We thank you for the good Samaritan that paid the sin debt. We might have eternal redemption through his precious, precious shed blood. Our Father, as the old song says, all to him we owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but he washed it white as snow. We're glad that Jesus paid it all, as all to him we owe. Use the message today for Christ's sake. Amen. Now as David plays for us, if there's anyone in this building today that'd like to get saved, come back to God, come down and join the church, 
uh, rededicate your life for any reason that God prompts you to come forward on, I want you to obey the Lord while she plays. Would you come? Maybe God is speaking to you right now. Would you come? How about it? Would you like for Northside to be your church home? Would you like to get saved? Would you like to come back to God? Would you like to come forward for any reason? Would you? Now is your opportune time. Would you come? Why don't you play softly for just another moment? Maybe somebody trying to make up their mind. help you. We will help you. 